Romans chapter 8 and verse 28. We'll just read it together, though we know it now. Hopefully, it's in our heart. And we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to His purpose. You know, you, I, you look at something like this quiet, serene scene up there, you know, and it, it just makes you think of peace. It's going to be okay. You know, your mind can be at ease. Everything's going to work out. Why? Because God's in charge of things. God's running this show, you see. And uh, that should give us a peace of mind that God's in control. You know, it's hard to accept, though, sometimes, the simple, clear truth that the, that the Scripture is telling us that all things work together for good. We don't always believe that. We certainly don't always live like that. But it's going to be okay. That's the title of the message. It's going to be okay. You know, I remember, remember my mother telling me uh, at what I believed were the worst times of my life that it was going to be okay. I mean, when my baseball or my football went on the roof over the neighbor's house. That to me was a tragedy, yeah. you know? Or, or I got sick and I couldn't go to the school. Uh, they were going to go out on an outing somewhere and I was sick and I couldn't go. To me, that was a tragedy. My mother said, it's going to be okay. It'll be all right. Or, you know, I didn't eat my peas, so I wasn't allowed to go out and play. <laughs> You're not going out until you eat those peas. Well, I'm not eating peas, so I'm staying in tonight. <laughs> but my mother would say, it's going to be all right. Yeah. And it is. It's going to be okay. There's not a one of us in here that hasn't gone through something, is going through something right now, or is going to go through something where they just need God. And it's going to be okay if we just trust in the Lord. You know, the, the Scripture tells us that it's something that we can know. It's something that is truth. That all things work together for good. This idea that everything is going to work out just isn't easy to believe all the time. It's just, it just, we just don't swallow it very well because we have little faith. But we must rest assured that whatever we're going through is going to work out for good. Somewhere along the line, God is working all these different lives and all these different courses of life together for good. Why? Do we, why can we believe that? Because it's the truth. It's the, it's the Scripture that all things work together for good. That is truth that God wants us to believe. The truth that keeps us sane. I mean, we could lose our minds if we didn't know that somehow this is going to work out. Somehow this is going to pass. Somehow God's going to work this all out for good. We might lose our sanity. You know, there's a lot I don't know. But this one thing I can know, good will come out of whatever comes into my life that God allows. Good's going to come out of it. There's a whole lot of things we don't know, but we can know that, to believe God. You know, imagine, imagine a fishing net. And you know, some of these nets, they're called gill nets. And they're tied up in such a way that the holes may be this big. And the fish really can't see a net in the water. They don't see it. So they swim into it. Now, a smaller fish than the, than the size of the hole in the net, he gets away. But the bigger fish gets in, his body gets bigger, and he gets in, he gets stuck. He can't back up now because the, the net is around his gill plates. Stuck there in that net. Aw, oh, <laughs> poor fish. No, he's going in, he can't squirm, he can't get out. And you know what? Our lives are in the hands of God. And what does he do? He opens and he closes the net sometimes. And sometimes he doesn't allow even the smallest things to come in our life because he knows we can't bear it. But sometimes he allows these big things that come into our life just to test us and prove us and let us know, I'm still in charge. That's through God's hands. It's like a mesh that he allows these things in our life. We have to believe that. We have to believe that. Look at how big God made the net for Job. Look how big God made the net for Joseph. He opened it so wide, but he keeps it nice and small for us, doesn't he? I haven't had that much tragedy in my life, and certainly not like Job or Joseph. But I, I know through all of it, God was still there. Let's put it into context. Psalm 34. Turn to Psalm 34. Psalm 34. In 
in verse 1, it says this, I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. My soul shall make her boast in the Lord. The humble shall hear thereof and be glad. O magnify the Lord with me and let us exalt His name together. I sought the Lord and He heard me and delivered me from all my fears. You know, God makes this thing personal. God wants to stay close to us and we need to stay close to Him. But in verse 4, you know, we can bless Him and we can praise Him and we can boast on Him and magnify His name and exalt His name and that keeps us close to God. And then we can seek Him when we need Him. He's only a prayer away. How often do you seek God first in the calamities of life? When, there's, when all these situations come, how often do you seek God first? Or do you seek friends and, and family or we pick up our iPhone or anything so that we don't have to, what, get on our knees and ask God to do something to help us? God's only a prayer away. What happened? I sought the Lord and He heard me. And God hears you. All you have to do is seek Him. Cry out to Him. God's the one that fixes broken lives. And He knows where your keys are too. He's concerned about the little things in your life. But He also takes care of the big things too. Because God loves you. But how often is He the first place that we go? Turn to Isaiah chapter 41. Isaiah chapter 41. We need to seek the Lord. We need to go to Him. Isaiah chapter 41 and verse 10 says this, Fear thou not. You ever been afraid? Because you don't know what's coming next? He said, Fear thou not, for I am with thee. You ought to just plant that down in your heart. For I am with thee. Be not dismayed, for I am thy God. I will strengthen thee. Yea, I will help thee. Yea, I will uphold thee with the right hand of my righteousness. I think God wants this thing to be personal with us. He wants us to know that he loves us. I'm going to be there with you. I'm going to go through it with you. When you're disheartened and when you feel weak, I'm there to strengthen you. Don't be discouraged. There's nothing that you're going through that I don't care about. That should help us. With God, this thing's personal. God says, it's me and you. I'm with you. It's going to be okay. God will lift us up and support us and sustain us when no one else can. He'll be there to help us. I don't want to get ahead of myself, but many of us don't know God in the hard times because we don't deal with Him during, during our week, during our regular, our regular life. It's like God is pushed away. And we're not close to Him in the good times, in the regular times. And when the trouble comes and when the rug is pulled out we don't know him he's not we're not close to him he's not somebody we would would look to i sought the lord and he heard me you know turn to romans chapter 8 romans chapter 8, eight. jesus prays for us romans chapter 8 you know what i'm sorry go all the way to hebrews go to hebrews first I tried to put these so we wouldn't have to go too far. Well, Hebrews chapter 7, they'd be kind of close to each other. Hebrews chapter 7, and in verse 25. Look at these truths. Hebrews 7, 25. Wherefore he, who's the he? Jesus. He is able also to save them to the uttermost, that come unto God by him, seeing he ever liveth to make intercession for them. You see that? Hebrews 7.25. To make intercession for them. He intercedes. He's the mediator. There is one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus. When we got saved, he was the mediator. And he's our mediator now in heaven. He's at the Father's right hand, interceding for us all the time. When the accuser of the brethren comes. Now turn back to Romans chapter 8. When the accuser of the brethren comes, Jesus is there, interceding on our behalf, praying for us. Look at Romans chapter 8 and verse 34. Who is he that condemneth? Who can condemn you? It is Christ that died, yea, rather, that is risen again, 
who is even at the right hand of God, who also maketh intercession for us. God, God is on his throne and Jesus is right at his right hand. Interceding for who? Us. He loves us. He cares about us. Everything that comes into your life, he cares about. And he's interceding and helping there on our account always for us. Look in, chapter, in uh, verse 26. Verse 26, Likewise the Spirit also helpeth our infirmities. For we know not what we should pray for as we ought. But the Spirit itself maketh intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. And he that searcheth the hearts knoweth what is the mind of the Spirit, because he maketh intercession for the saints according to the will of God. How can we not say it's going to be okay? Things are going to work out. The Spirit helps us to pray. You know, when you kneel by your bed and you have absolutely nothing to say, you're distraught. It's all gone. You have no strength. You don't know what to say. You don't know how to pray. He's praying for you. The Spirit of God is making utterances that you can't hear to the throne of God. And He, God, that searcheth the heart, knows what is the mind of the Spirit. God is praying to God. As far as I can see, the Trinity all working on our behalf. Jesus, the Holy Spirit, and God Almighty. So you know what? It's okay to just kneel by your bed and say nothing. And just wait for God to open your lips. And to praise Him and thank Him, no matter what you're going through. Because He cares. Just sit quietly. Because the Spirit knows that we're weak. And we don't even know what to say sometimes. We don't know how to pray. I know you've been there with me. Sometimes you just start chattering. And, and, and things come out of your mouth and you're really... And then you wander all over in your prayer. You don't know what you're saying. Well, guess what? The Holy Spirit's taking that right from your heart and taking it right to the throne. Because He cares. It's going to be all right. You know, God is not for us. I mean, God is for us, not against us. Look at verse 31. What shall we say then to these things? If God be for us, who can be against us? Isn't that the truth? If God's on my side, and if, and if He's with me, and I'm with Him, who can possibly be against me? He that spared not His own Son, but delivered Him up for us all, how shall He not with Him also freely give us all things? Who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? It is God that justifieth. In Christ we have all things. God spared not His own Son. Why would we think God wants to bring anything hurtful or cause despair in our lives? God's not the enemy. Satan is the enemy. The spirits out there of Satan, that's the enemy. Not God. But how many times have we shook our finger at God and say, why did you let this into my life? Why did you do this? It's your fault. And we've accused God. We have. God's not against us. Thank God, God is for us. Satan is our enemy. 1 Peter 5, 8 says, Be sober, be vigilant, for your adversary, the devil, walketh about as a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. That's your enemy. That's your enemy. You wouldn't want to get caught by this guy. You wouldn't want him sinking his fangs into your head but taking big chunks of flesh out of you. But that's what Satan does. It says devour. He wants to destroy your life. He wants to make you think that God doesn't care, and God does care. That's the enemy, and he accuses us before God. But in Christ, we are more than conquerors, because he is our king, and, and we're, we're in Christ. We have everything in Christ. That's the enemy, Satan. People aren't our enemy either. Ephesians chapter 6. Turn over to Ephesians chapter 6. Other people aren't our enemies. They're easy prey. They're easy to yell at and be angry at and say harsh words to people, but they're not our enemy. It's the spirit behind it. Look what Ephesians 6, 12 says, For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. 
It's not a fleshly battle. Although we make a lot of fleshly battles. And we get ourselves in a lot of predicaments when we start backbiting and talking about someone else. When we should be, when we should be kind to one another. Forgiving one another. As God for Christ's sake hath forgiven us. People aren't our enemy. It's a spiritual battle. It's spiritual wickedness in high places. It's in government. It's in religion. It's in the social order of the world. It's out there everywhere. Wickedness. As uh, whatever your name is. <laughs> it's amazing how I can have a mind where you, Eric, <laughs> were saying. <laughs> it came to me all of a sudden. Eric said, it's wicked out there. The battle is a spiritual battle, though. It's not against people. It's the spirit behind it. God is, not, God is for us. He's not against us. And then to them that love God, you know in the verse there, if we love God, let me just say this, if we love God the way we should, don't you think He would know? Don't you think He would know how much we love Him? And don't you think it would be revealed, it'll be seen in our lives, if we really love Him the way we should, He'll know it. You know, many, as I said before, do not experience the closeness of God in the times of trouble. Why? Because they don't live like they love Him during the week. Your life isn't, your, your life, your walk with God, you're not walking with God. You don't show Him how much you love Him during the week. And when the times of trouble come, you feel like He's so far away. Well, you didn't want Him by you the rest of the week. But all of a sudden, now the rug's been pulled out and you want God. Where's God in this situation? He was there all along. Barring a sinful lifestyle, which I'm going to talk about in a minute. Our lives are more about self-love. We care about us. We just love ourselves. And we don't want God until there's trouble in our lives. Then we want God there. Like He's a genie. Like we just rub a little lamp and say, God, give me those three wishes. Take care of this problem now. Not that I spent any time with you yesterday or this morning. Not that I prayed for one second today. Not that I cared one bit about the things you care about. But now, take care of the problem in my life. You know, the funny thing is, he does. The funny thing is, he does. Because he's full of grace and mercy toward us. How's your walk with God? How's your love for the Lord? You know, saying it, and not showing it to someone really reveals the heart. You could say you love somebody all day long. Leo, you could tell Pat that you love her all day long. But if you don't show it, you're only revealing your heart. That you really don't love her the way you should. And we do that all the time. We say we love God, but we don't show Him how much we love Him. And we bring many of the problems on ourselves. We can't blame God for our choices. Thank God He takes care of of a lot of those consequences and problems that we find ourselves in. But it's not God's fault. That's why Calvin is so off base with his predetermination. Some people have been predetermined to go to hell and some to heaven. No, we have free will. You made a choice to trust Jesus Christ as your personal Savior. He opened up your heart. He allowed grace to give you that opportunity. But you, by faith, had to trust in Him. You had to make up your mind. Well, guess what? You still have to make up your mind. Every day, whether you're going to walk with God or whether you're not. Whether you're going to love Him first and foremost or whether you're going to love yourself or the things of this world. We are the ones who choose to walk after the flesh instead of after the Spirit. Walk in the Spirit and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. Do you love God this morning? Trusting in the Lord's purposes. Turn to Proverbs chapter 3. Proverbs chapter 3. Trust in the Lord's purposes. If we do, it's going to be okay. You know what's amazing? Probably when I mentioned, when I clicked that up there and it said Proverbs 3, 5, and 6, some of you started to trust in the Lord with all thine heart. You memorize it. It's memorized. But how many of us are living it? You know, there's people that know great parts of the Bible. They can quote all kinds of Scripture. But it's never got down here. It's all up here. Get that verse down in here, and it'll change your life. 
Memorizing it is one thing. Obeying it is a whole other thing. But if we do, if we start living this verse, it'll be okay. Proverbs chapter 3 and verse 5, Trust in the Lord with all thine heart, and lean not unto thine own understanding. In all thy ways acknowledge him, and he shall direct thy paths. Do we really want the will of God for our life? Now, most of you are already shaking your head, of course I do. But sometimes we don't show that. We don't live like that. We don't live like we really want God's will for our life. You know, I remember when I was minding my own business, even as a Christian, I know God saved me and I was doing things in the church and, and I was growing in the Lord. And then he called me into full-time ministry. And uh, it got serious after that. And I thought, poor Andrew is sick this morning, but he could tell you the same thing that I'm telling you. It, it's, very, it's very overwhelming to know that God's calling you into full-time ministry because this really is the fun part, <laughs> is preaching the Word of God. Full-time ministry takes so much out of you if you're really, you know, like your pastor, like Pastor Craig. It takes so much out of you because you're not just living your life, you're, you're trying to take care of the other people too. And whether you have just a few in McCroom or whether you have a hundred here in Ballincollig, either way, it, it, you know, it, it's, it's a high calling. And it's, and it's sacred. I really believe that. It's honorable. And, uh, but I remember when I was at the church in, in uh, North Carolina, Promised Land Baptist Church, and not only called to the, to the mission field, but called to preach. And I remember how that overwhelmed me. And I went to the altar and I just cried and said, Lord. But I knew that he was saying to me at the altar on my knees, he said, will you go for me? That's what I heard. Right here I heard it. And I said, yes. And uh, you remember that. And uh, it shook me down to my foundations. And then a preacher told me, he said, if there's anything you can do and be happy doing it besides the ministry, do it. Don't go into the ministry half-heartedly. There's a lot of people that do that and go into the ministry half-heartedly. He said, if you, if this is more than a burden. You can have a burden for souls and not be called into full-time ministry. It's a calling from God. And uh, it's important and it's serious. But if you could find anything else, if you want to stay running a crane at that Navy base and keep doing that, and you like that, and it's good money, then don't go into the ministry because you'll give this up and go back to that. And, uh, you know, you have to make up your mind. Do I want the will of God for my life or do I want to do my will? That's just for me. But you have your own you have to make up your mind. Am I willing to do God's will? And you don't want to fight against it. We want to live this first. Trust in the Lord with all thine heart and lean not unto thine own understanding, but in all thy ways acknowledge Him. Do the will of God. And He shall direct thy paths. That ought to be pretty comforting to us. That God's going to put the way out there for us to walk. Trust Him. Give Him your heart. Do what He says. Obey Him. And avoid all the scars and the, and the bruises from a rebellious attitude. I have enough scars and bruises from my unsaved lives. I'd like to avoid a lot of the scars and bruises you can get from trying to wrestle with God. Just do His will. Except for a sinful lifestyle, let me say this. God is always there. God is always there. His presence is always there precious in our lives he's always there except when we want decide we want to sin and god kind of backs off now he's still there he still loves us but he's not close anymore he's moved away the holy spirit's not going to partake in our sin so barring a sinful lifestyle i can tell you this god is always there he's there right now no matter where you find yourself no matter what situation you're in no matter what seemingly hopeless problem you have in your life God is there turn to Isaiah chapter 43 God is there we've got to believe it Isaiah 43 verse 1 but now thus saith the Lord that created thee O Jacob 
And he that formed thee, O Israel, fear not, for I have redeemed thee, I have called thee by thy name, thou art mine. When thou passest through the waters, I will be with thee, and through the rivers they shall not overflow thee. When thou walkest through the fire, thou shalt not be burned, neither shall the flame kindle upon thee. I'm going to be there at every step of your, of your life, of every situation that I allow in your life. I'm there with you. I'm going to provide for you and protect you. And my presence will go with you. You're not alone. When it seems like you are, He's there. It's going to be okay. He said, I will be with me. You either believe it or you don't. He will and is protecting you. You know, you never know how many times Tunday God's held things back from happening in your life. How many times you had to go back to the house, and then you, you wound up watching a, a car accident. So huh? that just happened a few minutes ago. Why did God turn me around to go back for something at the house? How many things just didn't happen in our lives because God made the net a little bit smaller? I don't know. Thank God I don't know. But He's withheld a lot of things that He could have allowed in our lives. And He'll provide for you. Don't always ask, to remove the trial, pray for His presence in the trial. Because He's working it for good. And we want the thing to go away. And God says, I'm right here with you. Jesus was on the boat, wasn't He? When the storm was happening, He was there with them. Turn to Psalm 107. Psalm 107. Verse 23. Psalm 107, verse 23 says, They that go down to the sea in ships, that do business in great waters, these see the works of the Lord and His wonders in the deep. Now besides Tony, I know some of us have probably been in a boat out in deep waters. But most of us only play around in the shallows. We never go out into the deep waters. Why am I saying that? Because it's in the great waters, in the deep waters of God's will, that you'll see amazing wonders from God. When you venture out there, Moses and the Hebrews with their backs against the Red Sea needed God's presence and saw the power of God. If you want to stay in the pond, in the shallow part, you don't need God. You can do it all on your own. But once you venture out into the deep waters of God's will, you need Him. And guess what? He's going to be there. And that's where you'll, where you'll see the wonders of God. These, verse 24, these see the works of the Lord and His wonders in the deep. If you want God to take away every fiery trial in your life, you're not going to experience the wonders of God that He can do in the midst of those trials. When we venture out into the deep waters and do things that we never thought we could do for God, it's when you get out into the deep waters that you'll experience God in the most amazing way. Verse 25 says, For He commandeth, and raiseth the stormy wind, which lifteth up the waves thereof. They mount up to the heaven. They go down again to the depths. Their soul is melted because of trouble. Imagine being out there in that, in that kind of a, a storm. They reel to and fro and stagger like a drunken man and are there at their wit's end. Then they cry unto the Lord in their trouble and He bringeth them out of their distresses. Have you ever experienced the works and the wonders of God because you've attempted to do great things for God? I think that was William Carey said that. Attempt great things for God. I forget it now. I always forget things. Do you know it? Attempt great things for God and expect great things from God. Amen. But it can get rough out there in the deep waters. But that's when God will show himself. As wonderful and how good as he is. Look at verse 29. Verse 29 says, He maketh the storm a calm so that the waves thereof are still. Then are they glad because they be quiet, so He bringeth them to their desired haven. If you venture out there and things get rough, don't worry, God can calm the storm. Jesus did it. He calmed the storm. The waves and wind obey Him. It's a matter whether you want to go out there. Go where only God 
can accomplish the things in your life and bring to pass the blessings and the results in your life. Many of us are just trying to stay as comfortable as we can till we get home. And you're missing out on God doing something in your life, on just trusting in what God can do. It's not what we can do, it's what God can do. But we're only wading up to our ankles in water. I don't want to go out there into the deep waters. I, I feel safe here. Well, you won't experience God like you will if you go out into the deep waters and see His wonders out there. Verse 31 says, Oh, that men would praise the Lord for His goodness and for His wonderful works to the children of men. And God provides for us, then all the praise is reserved for God. Do you know what I mean? How many times can we pat ourselves on the back for what we did? Because we, we were able to do something. But when you get out there and you have to trust in the Lord, God gets the praise. Not man. God has to get the praise because only God could have done that. Only God can save a soul. Only God can change that broken life. Only God can bring that marriage back together. Only God can take away the grief and the sorrow. Only God can wipe away some tears. Only God can do it. And God should get that praise and that glory for what He can do. Look at Psalm 139. Psalm 139. God is never far away. It's going to be okay. Psalm 139 and verse 7, Whither shall I go from thy spirit? Or whither shall I flee from thy presence? I ascend, if I ascend up into heaven, thou art there. If I make my bed in hell, behold, thou art there. If I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost part of the sea, even there shall thy hand lead me and thy right hand shall hold me. God is never far away. He's always there for us. That should be some kind of solace for us, some peace of mind. God can be found because God finds you. When God is near, it's because He's found you. He's drawn close to you. Now look, Noah found Him before and during and after a flood. A cataclysmic world judgment. But Noah was perfect in his generations. And he believed in God, and God chose him. And guess what? Because he obeyed God, and he saw that God was bigger than the, than the calamity, his whole family was saved. Now, we've never had a judgment like this, but it's coming. But we're not going to go through that. What could happen in our lives, though? The passing of loved ones, financial woes, loss of job, health. But God is bigger than all that. To us, that's a cataclysmic problem in our life. But God's bigger than that. And He's there. And it's okay. Trust Him. Abraham found Him on Mount Moriah. There He is offering His only begotten Son to God. His only Son. God told Abraham to offer Isaac. It wasn't His idea. God said, go offer Isaac up on Mount Moriah. So I think God understands what, Isaac, what, what Abraham was about to do. How precious this offering was going to be. This was his son. But you know what we learn by sacrifice? How to be willing to obey God. And just do what God asks us to do. And what did God do? He provided a lamb. And he provided a lamb for us today, didn't he? Jesus Christ. God will provide. He is Jehovah Jireh. But first... You have to be willing to obey Him and do whatever God calls you to do. He was willing to offer His own Son. And God knew that He had found somebody who He could trust. Jacob found Him in a wrestling match. Can you imagine fighting with God? Yeah, we do it all the time, don't we? Tell me somebody who hasn't debated and argued with God. Sure you have. You get in a wrestling match with God, you're, you're going to lose. But you know what? God tenderly and graciously puts His finger on our life and says, I'm in charge, not you. <laughs> While we're wrestling away, God says, I'm in charge, not you. But He does it with such mercy and tenderness and grace in our lives. What did He do with Jacob after He wrestled with him? He took away his name Jacob and made him Israel, didn't He? He blessed him. He blessed him. But let me tell you why He blessed him. Because he didn't let go. He said, I'll not let go until you bless me. God honored that. 
Don't let go of God because he's certainly not going to let go of you. Jacob was not going to win this wrestling match. God just said, that's enough of that and touched him on the hollow of his thigh and he walked with a limp and remembered, this is what happens when you wrestle with God. You're going to get humbled, but you're also going to get a blessing if you don't let go. So hold on to him in the roughest times of your life. Jacob did. Joseph found him in a pit and in a prison. Now why are all these people finding God? Because God's already found them. For the Son of Man came to seek and to save that which was lost. He came looking for us. In the worst times of your life, Christian, when you're asking why something is happening, God is there. God never forsakes his people. Look at Psalm 37. Look at Psalm 37. Psalm 37 and verse 23. It's amazing sometimes to me how such familiar verses, all of a sudden they mean a little bit more when you, when you see them in a different light. The Psalm 37 verse 23, the steps of a good man, Joseph, are ordered by the Lord and he delighteth in his way. Though he fall, he shall not utterly be utterly cast down, for the Lord upholdeth him with his hand. Amen. You know, it's like Corey Ten Boom, that, that Dutch family, uh, the one lady there, she was a, a Dutch lady, and their family harbored the Jews during World War II. You know, you probably saw the video back there. Corey Ten Boom went on after the, after the camps. She got out of the camps there, the German camps. And... Uh, and she went and spoke to people all over the world. And the one thing she used to tell them is, well, let me get it right. She said, there's no pit so deep, his love is not deeper still. I think she experienced that in a German prison camp during the war. I think she experienced that. No matter how low you think you've gone, God's love and mercy is deeper. Always those, under, those everlasting arms are under there to hold us up. Though he fall, he shall not be utterly cast down, for the Lord upholdeth him with his hand. God's there. God's there. You can count on it. God never forsakes his own. Moses found him in a burning bush. When you least expect it, when you're minding your own business or sheep, God shows up. And he may ask you to do something that you weren't prepared to do. Maybe when you think God's finished with you, like Moses may have thought, maybe he really... He's not finished with you. He's only just beginning. Well, stop telling God you can't. Don't tell God you can't do something, especially when he's told you to do it. And don't tell God you won't, because Jonah did that. We're going to look at him in a minute. Don't tell God you won't, but... You know what? I think it's even worse when we say, God, I'm not, I, I can't. That's saying, God, you can't help me. You can't strengthen me. You can't show me how to, how to serve you in this area of the ministry. Or I can't do it. I can't teach Sunday school. I can't do this. I can't, I can't. God gets sick of hearing I can't. He says, will you do it for me? Will you, will you let me help you to serve me? Each and every one of us has probably said at one time or another, I can't. But there's not one safe person in this room that God can't use. Not one. And age is meaningless to God. Moses was 80 at the time, wasn't he? God, God showed himself in the, in the burning bush. God's never finished with it. You can be used by God. Don't say you can't and certainly don't say you won't. Elijah, Elijah found himself in a cave, right? Running from his enemies, afraid and fearful and hiding. Sometimes we just like to run away from the world, you know? Run away from our problems. Hmm. You know, nothing can really happen to us until God allows it. We're bulletproof. Now, I don't mean that you tempt God. Don't get up on a high building and jump off and say, hey, if God doesn't want me to, I will bounce and I'll be okay. No, that's gravity, that's a law, man. You are going down, you're going to hurt yourself. Don't tempt God. Jesus said that. Thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. He said, jump off the pinnacle of the temple. He said, you shall not dash your foot against a stone, the scripture says. He says, I'm not going to tempt God. So I'm not telling us to tempt God, but God, if God isn't allowing something in your life, you are bulletproof. 
The gun will jam. You know, you're, you're not going anywhere. You're not going to get hurt until God allows it into your life. Things don't happen until God allows it. All I'm saying is Elijah's here in a cave and he's running away from who? Jezebel. Isn't he? He's running away from Jezebel. And he finally came to the place and he saw God's omniscience, his omnipotence, and finally Elijah put the emphasis back on God and not Jezebel. And what happened to Jezebel? She got crushed by a stone and smashed into the pavement. And what happened to Elijah? Elijah was carried up in a chariot of fire to heaven. I think things can turn out pretty good for the Christian who says, I'm going to trust God. It's going to be okay. I'm not going to run from my enemies. My big brother's back here. And he's a lot stronger than anybody else. If he's for me, who could be against me? Don't run away. Jonah found him in the whale's belly. Running from the will of God. Disobedient. He didn't know it was going to be okay. And we've all questioned and debated with God. We've all been in the whale's belly. Thankfully, he vomited us back up again. We're here, back here. You know what all that tells me? God is the God of second chances, Leo. You make a big mistake and God says, I can still use you. I can still use you. Are you willing now to listen and obey and let me, let me carve you into something I can use, a vessel that I can use? This is the second chance, God. Don't be disobedient. But even if you are, God can still use you. He wants to use you. How about Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego? They found God in a fiery furnace, amen? There was a fourth man in that fire, wasn't there? In our greatest trial, God is there. Look, I could, the list was too long, and that's why we're not going to the Scriptures. There were so many. I, I thought of Ruth. Where did Ruth find God? Well, I didn't want to get into it because there were so many people. How did they find God? Because God found them. But here we are in a, in a furnace of fire. God didn't abandon his children. In the fire was the fourth man, the son of God, the son of man. And Nebuchadnezzar saw him. There's another person in the fire. Didn't we just throw three in? There's another one in there. It was Jesus Christ. He's there with you. Nothing's out of his control. They wouldn't praise Dagon. God got the praise, didn't they? Because of these three Jewish boys. Paul found him in a hurricane. What is that word? Eurocladin or Scladine or something. Anyway, I just called a hurricane. Amen? But the ship was going down. It was a horrible time out there on the, on the seas. And 276 souls were saved from seemingly certain death. Why? Because they trusted in what Paul said because Paul trusted in God. Nobody's life is going to, no one's going to lose their life. Stay aboard the ship. I'll bring it to pass. And look, we all go through storms in our life. And we say, now what? Now what do I do? Now look where I'm at. Now look what happened. Hey, why don't we just trust God? Why don't we just say, it's going to be okay. I'm just going to keep trusting God and doing what's right. He's going to have to get myself out of this. Amen. Trust God's word and obey him. He can work this out. In fact, he already has it worked out. Don't let me get in the way, God. Jesus can calm the storms in your life. Zacchaeus found him up a tree. Amen. You ever got yourself in such a pickle? You didn't know what to do next? How did I get here? How many decisions did I make to get myself into this situation? Zacchaeus was a little man. And he had to go up a tree to see Jesus. And you know what happened? Because he put forth a little bit of effort, got himself in that predicament, he got saved. He got saved. A lost man got saved. And let me just tell you something. When I've got myself into a pickle and got myself into a jam, guess what? God has been good to me every time. God's been good to me every time. And every time I've sought his help, every time I've asked him for help, do you know what he did? He helped me. He helped me because he loves me. And I sought him. And I said, Lord, I've got myself in a jam here. You say, well, it didn't help me. Well, maybe you didn't ask. James 4.2 says, you have not because ye... I just ask him, Lord, I messed up. You know, God can use mess-ups. Now, I got my own personal mess-ups. You think of your mess-ups. And God still used them for good. I can look back on it now, and I'm telling you 
that for my mess-ups, God brought good out of it. Even if it was to let me know who's in charge of my life. That's who God is. It's going to be okay. A thief found him on the cross. You know, when it comes time to die, he's there. Many a loved one may have passed, and at that last minute they just said, God saved me. Jesus saved me. And look, this, this man found himself on a cross. And he cried out to him, Lord, remember me when thou comest into thy kingdom. But why wait until your life is over? What are you waiting for? If you're here this morning and you're not saved, what are you waiting for? Is this where you want to be? You may never have an opportunity. For some reason, this thief was given an opportunity. He said, today thou shalt be with me in paradise. Are you going to be in heaven when you die? What are you waiting for? You want to wait until you're hanging on a cross? Don't waste one second. Get saved today. And you know what else? We found him. And you know what? It's because he found us. He sought every one of us in here that's saved. This picture's not too old, I don't think. It's a little fuzzy. But he found us. And we found him, amen? We found him, but he found us first. We love him, but he loved us first. We cried out to him, but he cried out first that whosoever will may come and drink of the water of life freely. He did it all. He initiates. He's the, he's the author and the finisher of our faith. We always try to do His will, but He did the Father's will first. And He's promised us, He's promised us that it's going to be okay. No matter what happens, it's going to be okay. So, what area of your life, what area of your life does God not care about? Because if you know one, would you tell me? I want to know what area of my life God doesn't care about. It's because he cares about everything in your life. And he's always there. And no matter what takes place, it's going to be okay. Because God cares about us. Every area of our life. Look, Jesus said in Hebrews 13, 5, I will never leave you nor forsake you. I changed that. Think about it. He will never leave me nor forsake me. And you could say it the same way. He will never leave me nor forsake me. Let me tell you why I think this is such a com comforting and, and unchanging statement. Because he said the same thing to Moses. And he said the same thing to, to Joshua. You know why I know that this will never change? First of all, obviously, it's the truth. God said it. But look at Matthew's up here on the, on the board. Matthew 27, 46. And about the ninth hour, Jesus cried with a loud voice saying, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani. That is to say, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Jesus knows what it's like to be forsaken. He's not going to allow you to be forsaken. Never. I will never leave you nor forsake you. Do not let it happen to you because he knows what it means. Go to Psalm 37, 25, the last verse here. Psalm 37, 25, that's on your same page, I guess. 37, 25, Psalm 37, 25 says, I have been young, Leo, <laughs> and I am old, and now I'm old. Yet have I not seen the righteous forsaken, nor his seed begging bread. God doesn't forsake his own. Whatever you're going through, whatever's happening, it's going to be okay. Now look, Jesus went to the cross and bore our sins alone. And he did it for you and he did it for me. Everybody in this room, he did it for. Everybody in this world, he died on the cross for their sins. You know, in that ninth hour, when he was forsaken of all, as his own father judged him there on that tree, Jesus became every vile sin on the cross. And he was cursed of his own father. He was cursed on that tree. As he hung there, 2 Corinthians 5, 21, For he hath made him to be sin, who knew no sin, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. He was cursed. He was sin on that tree. 
And then he paid for it. And he died for us. Sinner, why not receive him as your Savior today? If you're sitting out there and you're wondering, Mike, I don't know where I'm going to spend eternity. Why not receive the gift of eternal life today? Absolutely free. He's offering it to you. He died, he was buried, but he also rose again. He holds the keys to eternal life. And Christian, he can and he will take care of you. In all your daily struggles, in all the problems of life, Jesus, in a sense, says, it's going to be okay. I'm there for you. Amen? Let's pray. Heads bowed and your eyes closed. Again, I'll ask, as I look out, just asking if there's someone here today that doesn't know for sure where they're going to spend eternity. I mean, they've been coming to the church, or you may have been coming here for a long time, but you're not sure. If you died today, where you'd spend eternity? You're not sure. You can't remember when you got saved. You say, I'd like to know more about how to be saved. I'd like to know how to how to go to heaven, to know how I can be forgiven. You just raise your hand and say, I'd like to know how to be saved. I'd like to know how to be born again. Is there anyone out there that say, I'd like to know, because I don't know. What would happen if I died right now? You say, I'd like to know how to be born again. All right, Christian. God said it's going to be okay. Let's not call God a liar. Let's believe him. Heavenly Father, we know that your word is true. We've seen all of these different situations and read all these different verses of Scripture, Lord, that say you'll never leave us, you'll never forsake us. That all things do work together for good to them who love God, to them who are the called, according to his purpose. That's us. That's me. And Lord, you said that everything that happened in my life is working out for good. God, I pray that we trust you in a greater way. That we realize just how good you are to us that you're there, that you're present. When nobody else understands, you understand. Father, I, I just pray that this message will sink down in our hearts. We'd never despair, because despair is to say that God's not there, that we, that we believe you, Lord, that we trust in you, and we be renewed in our strength and not dismayed, and not disheartened, that we'd be encouraged in a way that we never have been before. No matter what the world throws at us, we're going to trust in our God. Father, I pray you bless the invitation and the hymn as we sing in Jesus' name. Amen.